you're looking for a place where it's okay to be messy, it's okay to be dirty, it's okay to be hurting, it's okay to be in pain, then you've come to the right place. This is the place where it's okay to not be okay. We don't have perfect people here. You want evidence? perfect We don't celebrate perfection here. But instead, we celebrate our weaknesses because we believe that it's only through our weakness, it's only when you're weak that God's strength is made perfect. We are still in talk three of our, our third installment of our current series on Workaholic. Has this series been blessing you? Has it been helping you? You've been looking at work in a different way, in a more positive way? Well, today, this is the third talk and uh, we're going to learn a lot of new things. You want to learn something new? You need a word from God, yes? Then let's all do this together as a family. Let's say our favorite prayer here at the feast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Everybody hands up in the air and say, today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings healing and miracles today i open myself to god's word so i become more like jesus every day today i proclaim that i'm god's beloved i'm god's servant shout it out because i am blessed i am blessing the world in jesus name amen thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a Today I want to preach to you in a few minutes that we have remaining on the subject of spirituality. Everybody say spirituality. That's right. Last Sunday we preached the message wherein we said that God wants to repair your walls. Everybody say repair your walls. We said that the walls represent your secular life, right? And that God also wants to repair your towers, which is really much uh, representing your spiritual life. God is interested in both. Everybody say both. He's interested not just in your spiritual life, but He's also interested in your secular life, what you do for a living, what your job is. All right? Here's our big message for today. Before you can repair your walls, you need to do one thing first. Can I ask you to preach it to the person next to you? Pick one person, whoever that is. And then tell that person, repair your altar. That's right. Repair your altar. Before you can repair your walls, you need to repair your altar. I'm going to go a little bit historical, if you don't mind, all right? I'm going to go back all the way to 586 BC, 100 years before even Nehemiah was born. Just about that time, there was a war happening between Jerusalem and Babylon. But Babylon proved to be the tougher city because they were able to defeat Jerusalem. They destroyed and wiped out the entire city of Jerusalem, including the temple, all right? And the Jews, they were forced to exile and migrate to Babylon for 70 long years. They couldn't come home until one day something amazing happened. Persia, another country, defeated Babylon. And the first thing that the Persian king did was he allowed the Jews to go back into the city. So you can imagine the happiness and the excitement of all these Jews coming back into their homeland. Do you know the first thing that they rebuilt? Ask me what? They rebuilt the broken altar of their broken temple. It says right here in Ezra chapter 3 verse 2, it says that Joshua, son of Jehozadak, joined his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtel, with his family in rebuilding, everybody say rebuilding, Rebuilding the altar of the God of Israel. Why? Because they wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it as instructed in the law of Moses. Before they repaired their city, they repaired their altar. There's a lesson to be learned here, my dear friends. Can I preach to you? Before God changed my life over a decade ago, I used to turn to things. When I say things, I mean substances. You know, drugs, smoking, partying. 
I used to turn to things to try to fix whatever was broken in my life. And I realized that people still do this up to today. People still turn to the pill. People still turn to the bottle. People st still turn to other people to try to fix what's broken in their life. And I realized something. I found out right about the time that God changed me that there are some things in your life, some things in your life that can only be repaired when you repair your relationship with God. Are you with me? There's some things in your life that can only be fixed when you fix your altar. What is your altar? Your altar is anything that you worship. It's anything that you put first. If God is not your altar, then it's broken. You need to repair your altar. One more time, could you elbow the person next to you and say, repair your altar. You need to put God first. That's right. Let me tell you what happened. While the Jews were, were, were rebuilding the temple of God, in all those years, 70 years, would you be excited to come back to your homeland after being gone for so long? 70 years. They started rebuilding God's temple, but something happened. You know how long it took them to rebuild the temple? Ask me how long? 18 long years. Because it says here in the Bible that, let's go to Haggai. God speaks to Haggai and tells the people, the people procrastinate. Everybody say procrastinate. They say this isn't the right time to rebuild my temple, God's temple. And then he asks, how is it that it's the right time for you? To live in your fine new homes while the home, God's temple, is in ruins. The people forgot all about God's temple. They started to build their own mansions, their own houses, their own private villas. They forgot to put God first. Why? Ask me why. Because they got distracted. Distraction, my dear friends, is a very dangerous thing, especially if you're not careful. Do you agree? We have so much distraction in our life nowadays. For example, technology is supposed to help you become more efficient. Yes, you agree? But if you're not careful, technology will distract you more than it'll help you. Let me give you an example. Just the other day, how many people like reading their scripture on the phone, by the way? Anybody here? It's practical, right? It's convenient because you can do it pretty much anywhere. You can do it on your commute. You can do it during your break. You can do it, do it coming home. I do it all the time but here's the thing just this week let me be very very transparent with you and honest with you just this week I was reading scripture on my phone early morning and then all of a sudden a notification pops up on my screen and it's my old friend Jason from high school and he comments on a photo that I posted on Instagram stories about a photo of me and my son in, in, a, in a billboard in Edsa and he says man that's so cool and then I, we started chatting we started talking and then all of a sudden he's, he's asking me are you going to attend the Guns N' Roses concert in Manila this coming November and I'm like Guns N' Roses that's like so high school anybody know Guns N' Roses? it's, it's this old band that we used to listen to in the 80s and, and before I knew it, I was listening to Sweet Child of Mine, replaying all the songs in my head. And I was thinking, my gosh, high school is so long. It's a long time ago. I'm, I'm, I can't believe I'm turning 40 this year. Can you believe it? And then I started wondering, where can I celebrate my birthday this coming year? So I started Googling restaurants and where we could celebrate. And that's when it hit me. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to be reading scripture not looking for restaurants and so since I was already in Google I typed Catholic daily readings didn't even get to Catholic daily readings because I was just typing C-A-T and then all of a sudden there's this Russian cat that could predict the winner of the first World Cup series game and I had to press it because every distraction ends with a cute cat video I went from reading all about Christ to watching a cat video the distractions are killing you my dear friend it's a dangerous thing to be distracted the enemy the enemy loves in fact that's the enemy's newest weapon nowadays distraction you want to know why because it's so easy to do it he doesn't even need to exert any effort 
All he needs to do to derail you from your destiny is to distract you with the next notification, with the next call, with the next thing that you need to do. You want to know how to deal with the distraction? Ask me how. A little louder, how? how? You take it one demand at a time. Stop trying to do everything all the time and just focus on one demand at a time. When you're praying to God, go ahead, clap your hands. When you're with God, when you're, when you're immersed in the Spirit, just be with God. I mean, when you're in the Blessed Sacrament, put everything aside. When you're at the feast or in church, put your phones to silent. Put God first. Put God first. Repair that broken altar. Could it be possible that there's some things in your life that are broken right now because God is not first in that area of your life? Put Him first because the amazing promise in the Bible is that when you put God first, when you seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, everything else will be added unto you. My message starts with, ha with, with Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. And it says, the people procrastinate. Everybody say that again, procrastinate. I remember a friend of mine, he said, Brother Bo, procrastination has destroyed my life. And this is it. I promise I will get rid of procrastination in my life tomorrow. You know, the problem with procrastination when it comes to dealing with God, ask me what? It's very deceptive because you're not disagreeing with God. You're just delaying what He wants you to do. You're not saying no. You're saying later. It's almost like, it's all, you, you know, you can even be, Lord, you want me to rebuild the temple? You know, if you were the Jew during the time, and time of time, Lord, you want me to rebuild the temple? Yes, that's beautiful. That's fantastic. I'm in it. Sign me up. I'm 101%. Yes, I will do it. After I set aside certain things in my life, Lord, you know, I'm, my desk is full. My plate is very full. I'll, but, but once that's done, Lord, nandiyan ako. It's so fake, right? It's, it's like, you know, and, and the, this is what happens when, when procra you see, procrastination exposes your priorities. Can you say that? And here's the problem. When you delay, what happens, this is what happens. I'm going to read to you a scripture passage from Haggai also. And he will tell you what happens. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. Chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Let's read together. Everybody, 1, 2, 3, go. Look at the result. You plant much, but harvest little. Pause. When you procrastinate, when you do not obey right away, when you don't do the will of God right away, this is what happens from the top. Look at the result. You plant much, but harvest little. Does this sound familiar to you? You work and you work and you work and you pour your striving and you're trying. And what happens? You're not satisfied with the result. Go on. You have scarcely enough to eat or drink and not enough clothes to keep you warm. Your income disappears as though you were putting into pockets filled with holes. My dear friends, I, I just want to ask this question to you. Everybody say, I'm listening. Do you sense shortage in your life? Do you sense lack in your life? If so, ask this one question. This may not be the cause for the shortage, but I know that for some people, this is the cause. You have delayed your obedience. And that's why there is also a delay of your blessings. It might not apply to everyone in this room, but it will apply to some people in this room. If it is for you, it's for you. If this message is not for you, it's not for you. But just ask the Lord that. If there is shortage in your life, touch somebody beside you. Don't delay your obedience. Because when you delay your obedience, you delay your blessings. In Haggai chapter 1 verse 2, the, the Jews, 
they, they were supposed to build a temple, but they said, it's not yet the right time. This isn't the right time. You know what? Let's say the opposite. Why don't we say together? Everybody, one, two, three, go. Now is the time. Elbow somebody beside you and say, now is the time. Whatever God is telling you to do, now is the time. Don't delay. But you know what? When you look at that verse that we just read, we plant much, but we harvest little. The shortage might not be outside. The shortage might be inside. Meaning to say, if you look around you, there's so much surplus, so much blessings, but inside there's a lack. There's a shortage. Do you know what I'm talking about? Can I give you an example? I mean, think about it. You look around you, there's so much wealth out there, but there's so much worry. There's so much consumption, but there's so much complaining. There is so much stuff, but there's so much sadness. Think of a, let's, let's think of a guy. Let's think of Carlo. Carlo was a clerk before, but is now a supervisor. When he became promoted to become supervisor, my gosh, he was so happy. Carlo was, was, was like on cloud nine. When he would wake up in the morning, he would say, hello, Carlo supervisor, you know? And he, and he would walk to his office with his, with his head high and his chest out, and, and he said, hi, I'm a supervisor, you know? And, and they, they, they upped his salary. They, they increased the salary to 32000 Whoa! He felt he was the most blessed person in the universe. You know, he knows, he knows 32000 will not be, you know, will not give him luxury. But, you know, now from Jolly Jeep to Jolly Bee. You know, he, he, he knows. He's just, he's so happy. So, so anyway, he, he, he really, really was a happy person, this Carlo guy, until... Say that with me, until, until he had this high school reunion. And he started talking to one of his former classmates. And as they were chatting, the, form, the former classmate tells Carlo, you're a supervisor also? Yes, Carlo said, oh, di ba? Galing. I have dalawang staff, two, 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 two in my staff. How about you? And Carlo said, 0.5. 0.5? Oh, dalawang boss, isang staff, hati kami. You know, we, we, we have, we have, there are two bosses, so we have one. 0.5. Oh, okay. So, pero okay, di ba? Supervisor. Yes, supervisor. And then the other guy said, you know, I, I, I can't believe it. I, I received now 52,000 pesos. Ikaw. <laughs> you know, from that time on, after that sentence, Carlo felt horrible. He hated his job, he hated his boss, he hated his company, he hated the fact that he was only earning 32,000, he hated Jolly Jeep and Jolly B. He, he hated everyone. Did the blessings change? No, there was a shortage inside. Why? It is comparison. When you start comparing, this is what happens. It steals your joy, it steals your happiness. I want you to, again, squeeze someone's hand until that hand breaks. And tell that person, stop comparing. It's true. You're just taking away the joy of the blessings of God. The shortage is inside. We planted much. We harvested little. But you know, I'll tell you why. Comparison is just the symptom of the problem, not the problem. Do you know what's the root problem? Ask me what? The root of a dissatisfied life is idolatry. Idolatry. <laughs> you know, when you hear the word idolatry, the first thing that comes to your mind, I know half-naked men, painted face, you know, bowing to a strange rock. You know, that, and, and maybe we're, we're, we think of those, those, things, those, those natives that we watch in the movie. And No, no, no. Modern people, we are idolatrous. Ask me when. Yeah. Louder. Yeah. When we expect from stuff what we should be expecting only from God. Only from God. 
And that is why the frustration level of people is sky high. People are so frustrated with their spouse, with their parents, with their children, with their friends, with their boss, with their job, with their career, because they're expecting something that can only come from God. But they're expecting it from their spouse. You know, when a marriage, when a, when a, when a, marriage, when a married pe uh, couple comes in front of me and they tell me that they got problems, that's the first thing I ask. I, you know, yeah, there might be abuse, there might be adultery, that's a totally different matter, but, but when there's none, there, when, when I know that they're faithful to each other and they're trying to love each other, but they're dissatisfied with each other, I ask that question. Are you expecting from your spouse what you should be only expecting from God? Because if, if God puts His love, you know, I love my wife and my wife loves me. But I don't depend on her for my security and my ultimate happiness. Do you got what I'm saying? I, I get that from God. I have a strong relationship with God. He loves me and He fills my heart to the overflowing so that when I get into my relationship with my wife, I don't drain her. I don't suck her dry. No, I get that from God. I go into marriage already full, overflowing with the love of God. And, 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 I'm, and that's the reason why I'm able to love someone. Am I making sense to you? You know, have you made your job your idol? That's my question. And, and you might say, well, maybe, I don't know, not really, Bo, not really. But, you know, let's go back to the time of Haggai. You know, the, the Jews, they were not build. You, know, you heard what Audi was saying? They were not building the temple because they got distracted with building their own temple. Meaning to say, they, they prioritized their homes, their house, before God's house. And I don't blame them. You see, when you have your own house, you get three things. Think about it. When you have your own house, you get security, you get status, and you get satisfaction. I mean, face it. If you have your own house, you have secure. If you're renting, the owner can kick you out anytime, not renew the contract. But if you have your own house, no matter how small, it's like your, that's your little kingdom. Status. If you have your own house, you level up. Before that, your real estate investment was the soil in your potted plant. That was it. But all of a sudden, if you own, no matter how small, oh, your status goes. Satisfaction. You know, you have your own house. There's convenience, there's comfort, there's coziness. You know, it's nice. Let's translate that to job because this whole series is about work. How many of you would want to have job security? Everybody. How many of you want to have job status? How many of you want to have job satisfaction? All of us do, yes? But here's my question. At the end of the day, is there really such thing as job security? A friend of mine, Benji, 30 years in a company, reports to the president, directly to the president. He thought he was secure. Well, one day, the president called him to his office and the president said, this is your last day at work. What security are you talking about? There's no such thing. Thanks be to God, he now has a, a, a business that's blessing him, earns twice now than whatever he was earning before. But I want you to understand this. Do not, everybody say, do not. Get your security from your job. Get it from God. Because if you, if you right now, have you lost your job? You're here, you're attending, you're saying, hey, Bo, that's perfect, I lost my job. Let me speak to you. God is your boss. He's just reassigning you to a new mission. And you need to believe in that. Status, you think you get your status from your job, from your position, from your title? <laughs> I remember Jimmy. Jimmy had a, had a he was an executive for 21 years. He was the youngest executive and he stayed in a company for 21 years. He had an executive car. He had a country club membership. They even gave him access to a private elevator. 
Only the executives can use that elevator. Secret, you know, from the parking, basement, boom. Only them. They hear a secret key. Well, Jimmy, he was telling me the story, retired, three years later, goes back to his office, half expecting that they will still give him special treatment. <laughs> the new security guards did not know him. This, this, the, no special parking space, no more. What special, special elevator? No, gone. Some of the employees said hi, they recognized him. Many of them did not. He was no longer in power. And he was telling me, Jimmy was telling me, Brother Bo, I gave my life 21 years as an executive to that company. Now I'm, I'm a nobody. They treated me like everyone else. They told me to fall in line like everyone else. It hurt my ego. I know it's all ego, but it hurt. I'm a nobody. I smiled at him and I said, think about this, Jimmy. In this world, we're all nobodies. But in the heart of God, you will always be a somebody. <laughs> Tell somebody beside you, you're a somebody. You're a somebody. In, in, in the book of Psalms, it says, God is our safe place. Can everybody say that? God is our safe place. He is, our, he is the source of our security. He's also the source of our status. You understand what I'm saying? Do not look at your job for satisfaction, ultimate satisfaction. Yes, be satisfied with your job. Are you happy with your job? Are you happy with your work? Do you love what you do? That's good. I'm happy with what I do. I love to preach, but I know that one day, I won't be able to preach the way I'm preaching to you now. I'll be older. And you know what? Other people, the younger people would not want to listen to an old man. Ultimately, one day, the people here in front of me will all be old. The younger people will go to the younger preachers because they, they, have, they, they can identify. You, know, you got what I'm saying? A day will come when everyone who will be here will be senior citizens. Our feast will be called Feast Airport. Departure area. Marketing slogan, almost heaven. You know, I, I was telling me this. She's a friend and, and she told me, Brother Bo, lahat ng mga artista, all the showbiz stars need to understand this. And I tell them this. A day will come. They need to be ready. You know, at the peak of our career, we cannot even walk in the mall. You know, a showbiz star, you walk in the mall in Tagalog, dudumugin ka. You cannot take one step. I mean, they're there getting your autograph and getting their selfies. It's impossible. But then before you know it, she was telling me this, before you know it, you get shocked. You walk in the mall and no one recognizes you except the older people. The young people ask, Mommy, sino yan? <laughs> Who is that mommy? And the mommy says, Sikat yan, dati. Ouch. She was famous once upon a time. If you're going to make that your God, you'll be very frustrated. Job, people, fame, money, all of them will fail you. Do not worship them. Do not expect from stuff what only God can give you. My dear friends, I urge you right now, repair your altars. Put God first. Worship God alone. And can I invite you to stand up? I, I just want to share this to you. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, you know this verse so well. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Tell somebody beside you all these things.
I'll end with this story. You know this story already. There was this mom, and she was shopping in a very crowded mall. It's almost Christmas. A little girl, her daughter, very small, very tiny. And the mother was scared because she might get lost in the, such a thick crowd. And she, she, she tells her daughter, Princess, hold mommy's skirt. Did, did you hear me? Do not let go. Yes, mommy. Yes, mommy. Okay. Two hours later, the mother goes to the security guard. Mama guard, mama guard. Have you seen a small girl holding a skirt? We make the same mistake as that little girl. We hold on to the skirt, not the one wearing the skirt. We hold on to our blessings, not the one who gives us those blessings. Can I make an announcement? Do not worship the blessings. Worship the blesser of the blessings. That's who you worship. Your jobs will go away. Your security will go away. Your status will go away. Your titles will go away. Your roles will go away. All of these privileges will disappear. They really, really will. Only God's love won't. And that's what you worship. You worship God. You make Him first in your life. I'm going to ask you this question. Is there something that God wants you to do and you've been delaying, you've been postponing, you've been distracted? Make a decision right now. Put your hand over your chest and say, Father in heaven, I want to obey you. I want to follow you. I want to live for you. I want to give my life to you. Father, here I am. I receive today your power, your Holy Spirit. I put you first in my life. In Jesus' name, Amen. What good is it to give the whole world? But lose your soul What good is it to make a sweet sound But remain proud In view of God's mercy
person here in this room standing in the presence of God. If you can just raise up your hands like this, only if you're comfortable to, the, to this posture, but just say this with all your heart. Jesus, my life is yours. And I thank you. I do not only seek the blessing. I seek the blesser. I do not only want miracles. I want the miracle worker. And so I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Be the center and be the Lord of my life. I will follow you. Thank you for giving me dreams. And I declare my dreams will come true.